the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day from James Gray Associates, specialist in payroll and HR recruitment. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Adrian Morrissey, Senior Commercial Manager at Amedius. If you're not currently familiar with Amedis but would like to check out the business during this recording, then please go to imedis.com. That's I-M-M-E-D-I-S.com. You can check out the company um, and more about their services as we undertake this recording. So Imedis are a specialist division of the Taxbax Group, a multi-award winning global financial services group established in 1996. They have over 1,200 employees and over 33 offices worldwide, providing payroll and tax services to organizations and individuals in over 100 countries every day. Prior to Medius, Adrian spent six years working in the recruitment industry for leading international recruiters, Robert Walters and Capital Markets before joining Amedis in 2017. Now I met Adrian recently at the Global Payroll Association's UK Summit in London, where Adrian was giving a talk on global transformation and technology in the payroll industry. And it quickly became apparent that he has a wealth of knowledge on global payroll, global compliance and global payroll software. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome him to the Payroll Podcast for this recording. So uh, Adrian, welcome. Thanks, Nick. Great to be here. Good to have you here too. For those that have listened to the podcast before, we always start with five technical questions. Five quick questions. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background at Amidis, your current role with the company, and also the thinking behind the Amidis company name? Perfect. So my I suppose my own background is my position in the company is very much to help Amidis grow. So a lot of my time is spent I'm liaising with customers in the market, existing customers, prospects, and also just a wider market around understanding what the, the major challenges are. I act, I guess, as the conduit between what the market is talking about, the pain points that exist, and obviously taking that information back into our in-house specialists in Amidis, both both from a, a technical infrastructure perspective, but also then from a, from a payroll delivery and tax expertise perspective. So it's continually educating and updating our own internal expertise on what the market is crying out for and trying to find solutions then to bring that back out and, and make our customers' lives a little bit easier. Excellent. Excellent. I, did, I did mention the company name in there because there's a little bit about the, uh, the background to Amidis and, and where that name come, comes from. Yes, yeah, so the word Amidus, you probably won't find it in a dictionary, but it's a play on the word Amidus. So what we've done is we've combined cutting edge piece of technology. It's a technology enabled solution to accommodate a global payroll platform, but it's backed up by in-house international tax and payroll qualified professionals. So the word Amidus is a play on the word Amidus, and that specifically re- relates back to our, our customer service and the ability to react quickly uh, on the spot to our customer's questions questions. Excellent. I know we're going to go into some of that in a little bit more detail uh, later on in this podcast as well. So now we met at the GPA Global Payroll Summit in March. And at that time, you were one of the keynote speakers. Can you give the listeners an overview of what you discussed in your presentation at the summit? Yeah, it's, it's I suppose a lot of the conversations that I'm having with the wider market currently is very much driven by technology. What's the latest and greatest? What's available to me? Um, and how can it make my life easier? So my presentation at the at the UK summit was focused on global transformation and technology as it relates specifically to payroll. So what I did was I looked at the developments in global payroll, where we've come from, where we are now and where we're going to without a crystal ball, but it was a prediction based on an educated assessment, but very much looking at how technology can assist with a fully managed end-to-end compliance solution from a payroll perspective. So we looked at the integration piece What are the most, I suppose, slick pieces of technology available to customers in the wider payroll market from an integration perspective? We also looked at the various degrees uh, from a maturity perspective around the integration kind of spectrum. We also looked at, you know, what the, the analytics piece behind technology that's available to the wider market. And again, the analytics maturity spectrum and the various different degrees and, and levels of access that customers have to that. We also looked at a number of different things around shortening the time 
that it takes to process a payroll focused a little bit around the, the RPA, the robotic process automation scenario, which ultimately yeah. a lot of companies are trying to get to, which will uh, shorten the time it takes to process, but it'll increase the time allocated to the customer to, to actually input their changes. Fantastic. And obviously RPA is a real hot topic in the payroll industry at the moment. An article recently in the CRPP magazine about it. And I know it's something that a lot of people are talking about at the moment. So you mentioned global payroll compliance there as well. So what advice would you give from an immediate point of view that perhaps would help a business simplify its global payroll compliance requirements? Yeah, look, I suppose there's no real hard and fast answers to it. There is, I suppose, a general response to that. But what works for one company won't work for another. So I guess the the, the, the advice I would have on that is is to look at, depending on the size and, and the headcount of a business, to look at centrally managing pockets or regions for the company. If the headcount isn't overly large, then ultimately you can look at a, a full global oversight. But I think for companies who would have anything in excess of 40, 50,000 employees and they're in anything in excess of kind of 50 countries across the globe, they absolutely will have a huge level of complexities around the, the local jurisdictional requirements across the globe. So I think central management with regional support led by experts is absolutely critical. Technology will allow you to, to get to a certain point, but it certainly doesn't allow for the intricacies and, and, and the changing regulatory landscapes across the globe. So having these in-country experts delivering on the ground, reporting back up into a regional oversight management team who will then liaise with you, the customer, in those time zones and in those regions, I think is absolutely critical. But I think the key message there is having on-the-ground expertise, in-country delivery teams who understand the nuances but centralizing and managing it from a global perspective that at the top level to actually manage across the globe. Yeah, that makes sense. And you may have answered part of my next question in that answer, but I know international companies with multi-jurisdictional payrolls often face really complex challenges. I know mm -hmm. that um, some particularly complex payrolls um, in France and Benelux regions in particular can be, can, yeah. can be quite challenging. Yeah. And what do Amidas do to help simplify some of those challenges? Well, I think what we do is we really work and, and listen to our customer base and the prospects that we speak to, to identify best practice. Now, when I say best practice, I mean best practice for that specific institution. It doesn't necessarily mean a blanket best practice that will work across the board for everyone. So it doesn't mean changing the entire picture or the entire landscape overnight. We tend to, to push back and advise and don't just accept the direction from the customers that we support. For example, companies who have you know historically had multiple outsource providers who assisted them with the delivery of their global payroll, you know, moving to a an overnight global solution can often be a daunting task, but it can often be yep. too much to handle from a successful perspective. So we will often split things up like companies, again, taking the bigger end of the scale who would have 10, 15, 20,000 in a region specifically like EMEA, for example. Many, many times we've actually advised to, to split Europe and, and the Middle East and Africa and focus on one of those regions at a time because the sheer complexities and the deep dive relationships required in Middle East and Africa, for example, to, to actually liaise with the underground local local tax authorities is absolutely critical and getting the compliance piece right in those particular jurisdictions is, is very much driven by historic relationships and getting that right and focusing on where the biggest compliance and risk challenges are are certainly more uh, I suppose more important to companies than something that's working who doesn't have the same yeah. risks, but it's just moving because you feel it's the right thing to do. So it's a very management consultancy type approach. It's not necessarily a client coming and saying, we need this. Actually, sometimes you might undertake a review and, and come across a, a different type of solution to what the client may have initially thought they needed. Well, it, it, it works both ways. I mean, you want to set something up that allows your customer to achieve success. And that also works from our perspective as well. I mean, we don't want to just take something and run with it because that's what the customer suggested. They often haven't been through the process before either. So sure. it's pushing back and advising on what you feel best works for them, obviously in a very consultative way. But, you know, a lot of the people in our business in Amidas are actually from big for backgrounds, consultancy backgrounds, for mobility tax backgrounds, and that then allows for a more consultative approach. And they've been used to large scale project management initiatives in the past. And yeah, it's certainly not a one size fits all. It's what works for any, any individual company. And we also look at the historic practices that have existed in those businesses as well. 
Excellent. Now you mentioned uh, compliance in there as well. Obviously, we've got the other hot topic in the in the payroll arena at the moment, which is uh, GDPR or General Data Protection Regulations coming into play mm. in May. What can payroll leaders do, in your view, now to take advantage of these data protection changes? Look, it's certainly a potential headache. I think a lot of companies have ultimately they've managed this in a best practice scenario to date. I mean. You know, it's it's moving away from a best practice to to following a strict set of legislative guidelines, which is the real kind of fundamental shift. It's it's becoming law as opposed to a guideline. But I think fundamentally, companies do have really kind of proactive measures in place across the board. I think the most difficult part for any company is actually understanding, you know, how to actually map out. What do I hold? What do I do with that information? And who do I share that information yeah. with? They're, they're kind of three really critical pieces of information around GDPR. Now, from me speaking to a lot of businesses across the globe, and it's not just European business, a lot of companies in the US or even APAC are rolling out GDPR best practice in those regions as well, because it's typically a global solution we offer. So these companies are actually seeing it as an opportunity to clean up the information that they hold. And I'm talking about the information required specifically to deliver payroll. What we have seen is the volume of companies who are now moving to a more automated payroll delivery solution. And that includes looking at their own internal systems and processes. So a lot of companies have now looked at new HRIS solutions uh, from a global perspective and deploying those internally to really clean up the data that they actually house to deliver payroll. So what they need to do is to, to clean that data up, input it into their HRIS system and find an outsourced solution that can integrate into that and automate the feed of information from their internal HR systems to the external consultants or external outsource providers that they engage with. And as I said, the, the key piece here from a compliance perspective is mapping all of that ahead of time. So what information do I hold? What do I do with that information and who do I share it with? And, and aligning that map to the risks that are associated and trying to find solutions then that fully protect the, the, the transfer of that information from internal to the external outsource provider. Sure, sure. That's a, very eloquently put. Excellent. Okay. So, I mean, we've talked briefly about global payroll compliance, uh, some of the multi-jurisdictional challenge payroll people can face in GDPR. If you were to summarize the, the services that Amidas offered a global client, what would they be in, in summary? What were the key sort of things that Amidas could offer a global payroll? So the three key pieces that we offer will be a fully managed end-to-end payroll solution. And that's everything from taking the changes, managing the remittance to the tax authorities. The the second piece will be managing the, the payments piece on behalf of our customers. So we manage, once a payroll is signed off, we can deliver payments globally in local currency to the to the end customer, which is the, the employees in local currency, but also then the remittance to the local tax authorities and the statutory bodies like pension providers, healthcare providers, etc. And the final piece then will be mobility tax solutions, which we can also centrally manage alongside our local hires from a payroll perspective as well. Excellent. Fantastic. And I think that will lead us in nicely to the, the next set of questions we've got. Before we get there, we're going to find out a little bit more about you. Time to find out more about you. So first question for you, Adrian, how would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? Uh, interesting question. I think my friends would always describe me as quite driven and competitive. Uh, that spawns from maybe my sporting background. I suppose the reason I do what I do is I'm quite a creative person, which my work colleagues would obviously attest to. Um, quite co- collaborative, uh, but in, I suppose the key message would be the, the sociable element. I'm very, very focused on long-term relationships, developing relationships, and I'm intrigued by the sheer volume and, and variances around the types of individuals that I interact with on a daily basis. So they'd be some of the key kind of aspects of me as a person. Recruitment uh, is a relationship game. So it's probably why you were so successful in that industry before moving into, uh, in, into the role at Amidas. You mentioned your sporting background. Tell me a little bit more about that. So uh, I would, for the Irish audience potentially listening to this, that I'd probably be better known for my endeavours in Gaelic football. So I would have represented my county for almost 10 years played in Crow Park many times in front of 80,000 people. So it was a, an interesting number of years. It was a six days a week commitment from a training perspective. So wow. very difficult to manage because it's an amateur sport and we had full-time jobs alongside it. 
but the bigger message and the, the bigger education that I got from that was just the sheer access to learning how to discipline yourself from a professional and a sporting perspective. And that it really allowed me to transition into some of the positions I've had to date um, with that kind of discipline and, and, and drive in mind. So Amazing. I don't know if I've just stolen your thunder here from the, from the second question, but uh, I was going to ask about uh, ask you to tell me something about you that perhaps other people won't know. Yeah, no, no, you didn't take it away at all. A lot of people Excellent. will have known about that background. <laughs> but um, Gaelic football, funnily enough, is an extremely physical game. It's a cross between rugby and soccer, I guess, if you were to look at it. Um, funny enough, I actually represented my country in badminton as well. So <laughs> two wow. polar ends wow, of the okay. opposite scale. So, sure. uh, yeah, so that's something that I haven't uh, spoken to the to the masses about. But uh, there you go. They'll know about it now. So A bit of a delicate sport mixed with uh, a, a quite a physical. I played Gaelic football once um, God, many years ago over in over in Dublin. And it was uh, it was a bit of an awakening uh, for me from a football background. It was a bit more physical than I was used to. It's good fun, though. It's good fun. <laughs> So, okay, slightly different here. We do this for everybody on the podcast, but you are abducted by aliens and they want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? What item would I take with me? I would take with me a Texas Hold'em poker set. Okay, nice. You play a lot? I play a bit for fun. Uh, I just think it'd be interesting to assess my capabilities against a different uh, race. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. What are, are they, again, it's a slightly similar question then, really, but what game, or let's, let's leave it with which what instrument then would you teach them? If you could take an instrument with you, what would you teach them? What instrument would I take? I play some Irish musical instruments, so I might just bring a mandolin or a bowron with me to give them a little bit more of an insight into the traditions from a musical perspective that exist here in Ireland. You're sounding very multi-talented here, Adrian. With uh, you actually, do, you, do you play the mandolin? You said you used to play a few instruments. Yeah, I do. I do. I don't play it any longer, but I, I'd certainly be able to play it. So, uh, But yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm multi-talented. I try everything and I try some of them and I, I perform badly, but I like to try a lot of things. <laughs> That was great. I and mean, from my perspective, I was speaking to an international level Gaelic and uh, footballer, badminton player and commercial director of a, a multinational company <laughs> who also plays the mandolin. It's, uh, it's quite an uh, impressive mix. OK, so what would you tell them about humans? I would tell them, again, relaying it back, if I was sitting down with a game of Texas Hold'em, I'd tell them that humans are 100% honest when playing poker almost all of the time. <laughs> Very nicely put. Fair enough. What truth would you or human trait would you hold back? Again, back to the poker, I would not tell them that we sometimes bluff. <laughs> Nicely linked. Okay, cool. That's good. That's good. But let's delve back into the, uh, in, into the questions. Five technical questions. Number one, if I was a global payroll director about to roll out a new payroll platform, what advice would you give me? Yeah, it's a funny question. It, it, it... It's, it's often a, a career defining moment for a global payroll director, especially if certain things have worked uh, with the existing framework that they've had in place. Um, I guess the, the advice I would have is very much about knowing the problem areas, fully assessing your own internal structures, processes, systems before committing to a project, you know, knowing what is the actual reason behind going to market to change. Um, I, I think you know, it has to be almost associated to a compliance risk um, because ultimately the reputational damage that will happen or exist as a result of non-compliance can be too great to actually retrieve or pull back from the market. So, sure. you know, it has to be a genuine reason. It can't be just because it feels like the right thing to do. Other people in the market are doing it. And it certainly can't be driven by a desire to, to change the, the landscape for a company just from your own career perspective. You can certainly have an extremely successful career by keeping it as is and cleaning things up slightly. But I guess knowing what you want to get out of it and why you're doing it are the key questions there. But there are so many, there's so much access to, to support and information in the market currently. My advice would be to build a bank of knowledge and make sure that if you do go to market, you engage with an external provider who has, I suppose, you know, the latest and greatest from a from a technology perspective and um, who can actually support and assist you and, and more importantly, change their technology as the market demands it going forward. Excellent. Now, and I, and I know Amidis um, use your, your own SaaS global payroll technology, as I understand, or technology platform. What does mm -hmm. this mean for your clients? 
Yeah, it's a, again, it's a it's a brilliant piece of technology uh, combined with expertise, I think, and that's where the real differentiator would be. But it gives companies central management, uh, full global oversight of where each of their payrolls are globally. It also offers that cutting edge integration. It integrates with any kind of existing HR or finance time and ascendant systems. And what you're trying to achieve here for your customer is removing the historic manual lifting where possible. You're removing that human touch point. You're allowing customers to free up their internal resources and allocate them differently in a business. And you're bringing away the reliance on that kind of human touch point, which, which is ultimately where sometimes errors happen. And that's through no fault of anyone's. It just happens. So you're trying to really correct that by automating the process in a really, really streamlined way. And what it does for our customers, as I said in the, at the beginning of the process, is that it actually elongates the time that they have to input changes. And we process the payroll in a very, very fast way, comparatively speaking, based on the RPA scenario. Sure. So, I mean, with, with RPA coming in and with, you know, automation being implemented if you like across pels at the moment mm. one of the new skills that we often talk about that the industry is uh, evolving to is uh, is more skills in reporting and analytics so mm. can you re- recommend any ways a payroll professional may be able to utilize reporting and analytics to improve delivery bearing in mind the increased automation and, uh, and rpa that's coming in i think ultimately what the the analytics piece will allow a company to do is actually it happens by default of having good information in your actual platform so this is a real kind of after the fact harmonized analytics tool that i suppose companies can use in a tangible way and where companies will really see the benefit of this is where there's been a historic cultural i suppose look at payroll as a cost as opposed to something tangible that you can use in a strategic way so i think that's where the real value add will be from a reporting and an analytics perspective is to bring that kind of harmonized you know multi-country reporting uniformed output across the board that you can actually now say here you go to a cfo these are the costs from a from a pension perspective that we've paid out in emea over the last 18 months or across emea or across apac or globally and so it's using the information in a harmonized way to really assess costs and allow at the top table to strategize based on the information you're shooting out from a payroll perspective. So would you see the person doing that analytics and reporting? Would you see that as a role of a, a payroll director or payroll manager? Or would you see that as a specialist you know, going forward in the future, a specialist payroll position, maybe a payroll analytics specialist or whatever it might be? Would you see it as a, as a, a role in its own right? Or would that form, in your view, part of an existing payroll director or payroll manager remit? Great question. I think, to be to be honest, Nick, what you're trying to achieve here is a piece of technology that will will almost do this for you as a result of the information received. So I don't think it needs to be a specific assigned task to anyone. I think what it should be is the end user or the customer who's using this particular piece of technology. So I talked about different regions. I talked about US, I talked about EMA and APAC. You should ultimately have an owner in a customer's business in each of those regions who can report on all of this in a very, very user-friendly way without having to have it as a specific piece um, or a a specific responsibility for them. If the outsource provider is offering an end-to-end solution, the data analytics and the business intelligence tools should be a part of that offering that the end customer will ultimately have access to when required. It can be really well used to support strategic decision-making. You use those analytics and that reporting to to justify, for want of a better word, a reason for making a change or, or, or improving a process. No, absolutely. Um, and that's that's ultimately where you want to get to. It's a, a singular corporate analytics platform and, and a vision across all needs and geographies for a business. So with, with technology changing then, um, we've mentioned RPA a couple of times. Uh, for those not familiar, mm. that's robotic process automation on the rise. Um, how do you see the payroll industry in three to five years from now? Um, I think where companies are trying to get to is, you know, the, the four things that they absolutely want are improved automation, automated validation, which is the, the RPA piece, and business intelligence and analytics. So from an RPA perspective, I think where we're going is faster, more efficient turnaround times, which will increase the time that customers will have to input changes, less time required to process the actual payrolls. I think ultimately where we're going to get to is as more companies look at their internal structures and they roll out, you know, single source of truth, HRIS systems, you know, the human input will become less and less required from a customer perspective. 
perspective. I don't think in an outsource provider's perspective, you can ever replace the expertise from a tax or a, from a payroll perspective, because ultimately the changing landscapes from a regulatory perspective will never be captured by a piece of technology. But combining both of those will ultimately remove the customer's need to have internal resources. And they certainly will never need to increase the level of resources uh, internally if the headcount of the firm increases across the globe because automation, RPA, that double validation piece will allow for correcting any potential errors at the end of a process at the very beginning of a process when the changes are inputted by the customer. Excellent. I think there'll be a lot of people relieved to hear that you don't see it necessarily impacting on the fact that we still need payroll people, human people to manage the process and manage the data. It's certainly a, an area that um, we've had payroll people you know, concerned about how they see the industry moving forward. So it'd be really encouraging for them to hear an industry leader talk about the, the need for, for there always needing to be a human human element to the process. I just wanted to really go back on the, the human interaction piece. I think what's happening or what will happen for global payroll directors in businesses who do outsource, for example, there will always, always be that need because the relationship management side and that customer engagement piece just simply has to happen. You can never fully remove and become a, a, a 100% automated. I think just given the sheer volume of changes, the sheer volume of complexities and the volume of countries that certain, certain companies are physically present in, you absolutely need that kind of project management type background, that mindset where they can oversee, you know, an ongoing changing landscape that that technology will absolutely support that and allow that to become a reality. But it needs to be driven from both sides by, you know, strong relationship management expertise and, and project management backgrounds. Excellent. I think um, we're also seeing a, a rise or an increase in the skills people look for in terms of relationship management, communication skills, stakeholder management. They're, they're definitely becoming skills that used to be much more associated with the HR professional, but actually in job specifications now, certainly within the payroll remit, we're seeing a lot more skills being required along stakeholder management skills, communication skills, relationship management skills and so on. So that's, uh, that was really well put. So what advice would you give then to a power manager who who wanted to elevate themselves to become a strategic advisor to the board in the future? Yeah, I think that that, that question is, is an interesting one because I think we've come from a place even just 15 years ago, which is quite a short period of time where paying people in cash, then all of a sudden we moved to pay slips, physical pay slips and checks and into employees' bank accounts. Uh, payroll then moved to, you know, managing kind of multi-country payrolls with multiple providers or outsource scenarios. And now it's it's becoming, you know, a far more, I suppose, critical conversation at the top level in a lot of companies. So becoming a strategic advisor to the board is ultimately going to happen if you can present to the board tangible information that will allow or support strategic decisions at the top level that will, look, number one, I suppose, save costs across the board. Um, so looking at bottom line, what, are we co- what do we cost in Singapore versus Croatia, for example, from a finance perspective, or what are we paying out in employment contributions in X country versus another? You know, having access to that on-the-spot information will give the C-suite and the board a real level of comfort that actually this payroll scenario, this payroll information is critical to the future of our business and can really support from a strategic perspective how we operate and where we operate. So I think this is excellent advice. I mean, one of the things that's uh, become quite apparent across all these podcasts I've been running is, you know, the one thing that everyone seems to want to do is to elevate the payroll industry. It's still seen potentially as being behind other functions, maybe accounts, mm-hmm. HR, whatever it might be. I think here you've just very well and eloquently put a, a very clear path for people to to elevate the industry. They, they can do that by using some of the, the systems analytics reporting tools available to them to actually make themselves more more relevant to a board to develop yeah. reports that can actually make a real influence at a strategic level. I think that's, you know, there's definitely opportunities here then for people that do want to elevate their positions within the payroll to do that at board level. That's a really good thing to hear at the end. So look, we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. What is one piece of advice you would give to someone then working in payroll right now? I think it, it kind of relates back to the question we just covered in a, in a sense in that just make sure that you're in an organization where payroll is a visible uh, function and seen as a crucial department as opposed to a cost. So I think positioning <clears throat> payroll in the business is critical and making sure that you are seen as you know something that can add genuine value to the actual overall structure of the business and i think just specifically then from a payroll person's perspective is to really expose yourself 
to as many jurisdictions as possible. As this industry evolves, I think the, the world has become a much smaller place. So trying to gain expertise and exposure across multiple jurisdictions, even from an oversight perspective, would be a really, really crucial part to elevate your career and put yourself you know, in a regional oversight role in time. So taking snippets of information and exposing yourself to projects by actually asking the question, whether you can actually get involved in these things are crucial rather than waiting for things to happen. Being proactive about what you take on and, and, and getting in under the hood with an expert who has done it in the past would be really, really important piece of information. That's a fantastic answer. I think if you'd given me that question, if I would, would have attempted to have articulated it in exactly the same way. So it's how I see it from a recruitment perspective. Um, <laughs> get, get to grips, particularly with multi-jurisdictional payrolls, it's, it's, it's what's happening across multiple functions at the moment. And yeah. if you have an opportunity to develop your skills in those areas, then, then definitely take take it because you know payroll is, is going to change and as you say the, the world is getting smaller so fantastic advice thanks for that so with the benefit of hindsight what would be the one career decision you would change yeah um, it's funny i've been asked that question before and I'm, I'm genuinely a firm believer in everything happening for a reason i think you know when i left school i didn't really know what i wanted to do and i certainly didn't grow up um with a poster on my wall saying i want to work in payroll um, but I think everybody finds their path. I don't think I would change anything because ultimately I wouldn't have landed here in Amidas without the previous experiences I've had or experienced. And sure. I don't think I would change anything because certain parts of my career allowed me to operate at the top level from a sporting perspective, but also brought the discipline that I wouldn't necessarily have secured if I hadn't operated at that level in my sporting career to bring to the role that I have now in Amidas. So I wouldn't really change anything. I know that's a boring answer, but <laughs> it's how I feel. Well, you probably didn't have a post on your wall like I didn't saying you wanted to work in recruitment either but that's, uh, but that's where we started <laughs> it's one of those industries like payroll really recruitment and payroll you, you tend to fall into i think it's not necessarily a career path that people choose you know when you leave when you leave school but actually can be a really rewarding path later no, and i think it's re it's rewarding in the sense that you know the fact that i suppose your business are sp so focused in a specific sector in a specific space there's more to it for you guys sure. than just re recruitment there's a huge element of consultancy and advice that actually companies can genuinely benefit from so i i think when you're really targeted in what you do it becomes extremely enjoyable and you genuinely feel like you're adding value so yeah 100 percent. you know, see careers change and you've done it for a long time there were payroll administrators that i placed 15 years ago that are now senior payroll directors and uh, and watching that shift is uh, is quite an amazing one to you know and the industry's changed in that time as well so it can be incredibly rewarding when you look over a period of time absolutely um, fabulous so if you had the power of foresight and you could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement what would that action or improvement be yeah i i guess the the advice i would have have there is that ultimately the long-term view of, of what the payroll industry will look like in my opinion is moving to that automated that integrated scenario so I think if I was to look at changing the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, it would be that every company globally looks at cleaning up their own internal structures and HR systems to house clean data, clean information, hold a single source of truth to allow when they go to market to deliver payroll or, or plug into an outsourced provider that the fundamentals are already there, the foundations and the building blocks exist to allow them to actually achieve what they want to achieve from an automated a perspective when they go to market fantastic well two to go who motivates you and why i suppose my family first off i'd have to mention because i have two young kids my wife they're all extremely supportive and i suppose day to day they're the reason i do what i do i don't ever kind of believe in you know talking about people that i've never met people who've obviously made a, a difference in history have have certainly influenced what i do to a certain extent but i think it's the people you surround yourself day to day who actually experience with you what you do are the people who ultimately allow you to to take the shackles off and achieve what you want to from a career perspective so i'd absolutely mention my family there. The one thing I suppose from a work perspective that motivates me would be speaking or meeting to a customer after they've been through the trenches from a, you know, looking for solutions in the market that haven't really worked or things haven't really worked out for them. And we've actually sat down with them in a, in a really, really consultative way and created a solution for them that works specifically for their business that they had struggled to achieve. That just, that feedback from a customer, it, it, it's extremely motivating and, and, and it just brings huge satisfaction to what we do. And again, it copper fastens the idea in my mind that this business that we work in is completely built on expertise 
And now we've allowed that expertise to, to really flourish in the market by combining it with technology. Fantastic. I mean, that resonates with me as well. I mean, we talked about recruitment, but, uh, you know, getting getting an assignment where they may have used high street agencies or generalist agencies and then they come to us as a specialist and we're able to deliver something different that solves all that heartache and those problems. It's, uh, it's not a better feeling. So I definitely get that. I definitely get that. I've also, I would probably put my family, I've also got two kids, so we're in a, we're in a similar space. Um, <laughs> okay. So if you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? Uh, something obvious, I guess, like a famous Hollywood actor, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've, I, I suppose I, I could have gone a number of different routes. I could have tried the sporting career. I, funny enough, I turned down trials uh, in the UK with a couple of fairly well-known football teams when I was about 14 or 15 okay. to actually go and represent my country in badminton. So who knows? I don't know. I may not necessarily have been good enough to ever achieve a professional football contract, but I might be there if I hadn't have gone down this route. So. Fantastic. Fantastic. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, do this podcast with me today, Adrian. So thanks a million. I think we've learned an awful lot about global payroll compliance, RPA, how to manage multi-jurisdictional payrolls. It's been a really exciting and educational talk and, uh, and journey through what Amidas do and what they offer, how payrollers can go about elevating themselves in the payroll market, using the tools at their disposal, such as reporting and analytics, to really improve and have an effect on strategic decision-making at board level. I know it's something that the payroll profession as a whole is really keen to develop and establish, which is to improve their relevancy and importance in the market. And I think Adrian's given us some fantastic insight there today, how payroll managers, payroll directors, and so on can really utilize some of those tools to elevate themselves and elevate the industry as a whole. So really, really thankful for that. Obviously really excited to have Adrian on the show being an ex-recruiter as Adrian is it's you know we've got some, uh, some synergy here both working now in, in the payroll industry I really enjoyed the talk some really good insight found some great information out that I didn't know before such as the fact he's uh, an international badminton player and a Gaelic footballer of a very high standard so that was really exciting to hear as well and just wanted to ensure that if people did want to find out more information about the multi-country payroll and tax services that Amidas do offer, please do take a look at their website. There are some excellent uh, white papers that you can download from their site as well if you do want to find out more about global payroll. On their site, they've got a blog, they've got a resources page, they've got webinars, they've got white papers. They've also got country guides. So if you are looking at a specific in-country payroll issue, do take a look at their website. They've got some really good guides that cover subjects uh, for payroll functions across Canada, Australia, the US and more. So it's definitely worth having a look at that. They have some webinars as well on their website that cover issues such as global payroll compliance, the culture communications piece, where they speak to some industry experts themselves. And they have a webinar on global payroll and GDPR compliance. So if you haven't listened to the GDPR podcast that we released a few weeks ago and you're still waiting to get up to speed from a global perspective, then it's well worth taking a look at that webinar on their website so so do take a look that's amidis.com been fantastic to be with you today adrian thanks ever so much for your time and i look forward to speaking to you all on the payroll podcast next week you've been listening to the payroll podcast with nick day of jga recruitment specialist payroll recruiters if you would like to feature on a future podcast please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.